Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for our consideration in this sermon is the gospel reading we just heard from St. Matthew. However, we are also going to listen in to St. Mark's account of the same episode for some additional insight along the way. So last Sunday and the Sunday before that, while you were not in church, Jesus was busy cleansing a leper, healing a centurion's servant, relieving Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. And then when word got out that Jesus was in town, Matthew writes, that evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. Isn't it nice to know that Jesus is still at work even though we didn't come to church for the last two Sundays? Matthew goes on to tell us, now when Jesus saw a great crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side, the other side, that is, of the Sea of Galilee. And just who did he give these orders to? Well, he gave them to his disciples. Mark writes, he said to them, his disciples, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat. I always think that it's nice when the Lord asks you to do something for him that you're good at and that you know how to do. It's those, it's those, mm, those challenging tasks that he asks you to do that you're really not good at and you hate doing that I don't like. But these being experienced sailors who knew how to sail this boat across the Sea of Galilee, my goodness, wasn't it great when their Lord asked them, take me to the other side, and they said, hop in, we're your servants. Besides that, Mark also tells us that this all happened when evening had come. And as every experienced sailor knows, evenings are when the sea is at its calmest, but not on this cruise. And a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. And so maybe it wasn't the storm of the century, but listen, when the waves are breaking into your boat, well, then it might as well be. When the waves are breaking into your boat, it really doesn't matter, does it, that there have been worse storms than this on record? And so really, I have never understood why it is that people think that it's comforting to, sell, to tell somebody who's in the midst of a crisis or a tough situation, well, it could be worse. Frankly, I think that's just our way of saying, that's a real shame you're in the mess you're in, buddy, but I have no intention of getting into your boat with you. So maybe you've never been on a sinking ship. Or maybe you have been. Or maybe you are right now. Or maybe, just maybe, we all are on a sinking ship because after all, we are all perishing. But he was in the stern asleep, Mark says, on the cushion. And they woke him and they said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So whenever the ancient pagans faced a crisis, they always figured it was because the gods were sleeping. The gods are in control of the natural elements. And so when the, when the gods went to sleep, the natural elements just went crazy. It's kind of like kind of like when you leave a two-year-old alone in a room for a little while. Hmm, nothing good comes of that. So an awful lot of pagan religion was all about how do you wake a sleeping god? You do a rain dance to wake the rain god. You do a war dance to wake the war god. You engage a prostitute to wake, wake the god of fertility. And the louder and the more outlandish the ritual, the more chance you have of waking the gods. We have our own ways of trying to wake a sleeping god. 
my humble, quiet prayer in my room with the door closed is not nearly as effective as a good long prayer chain, the bigger the better. We try to rouse a sleeping God to action by provoking his pride. We question his ability to be the God whom we've created him to be. Don't you care that I am unhappy? Don't you care that I am unsuccessful? Don't you care that I'm being treated unfairly? Don't you care that I am in pain? All of this, all of this is meant to rouse a sleeping God, to rise up and to defend his honor and prove himself to us that he just may be able to justify himself to us. And if that doesn't get the action we're looking for, well, then we take our cue from the disciples and we go, we go right to the bottom line. Don't you care that I am perishing? And so here's, here's the thing. Here's, here is the really, really odd thing that uh, we just can never get our head around. The really odd, strange thing is this. This God, this God just loves to be provoked by us in just this way. He put his word into the psalmist's mouth. He says, call upon me in the day of trouble. And I will deliver you and you will glorify me. So we know what happens next. Jesus sits up, rubs the sleepy dirt out of his eyes, surveys the situation, says, peace, be still. Kind of like you'd tell a barking dog to shut up and go lie down. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Not just a calm, but a great calm. So we didn't know it at the time, but maybe the psalmist was speaking about Jesus when he prayed, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them, Psalm 89. He was talking about Jesus when he said he made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed, Psalm 107. And then he said to his disciples, the experienced sailors, the one who knew how to take this boat across the sea, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves for misbehaving, and then he rebukes his disciples for misbelieving, and therefore mistrusting. And before we go wagging our finger at them and say, oh, how could you? Let us be reminded of how often when the waves were breaking into our boat, did we accuse the Lord of sleeping and not caring if we perish? Don't you care if we perish? Now just listen to his answer. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish. Why are you still afraid? Have you still no faith? So now the sea is calm. It is a great calm. And yet in the midst of this great calm, an even more fearful storm breaks out over the hearts and the minds of these disciples who are in the boat. It was the psychiatrist Sigmund Freud who said that man invented God in order to help him deal with the unexplainable and the unmanageable. When things move out of our control, Freud said, we need some way to account for the unaccountable and to manage the unmanageable in order to find some reason behind it and in order to find some peace in it. The unexplainable and the unaccountable are simply too difficult, too scary for us to deal with on our own. And so we invent a God who is in control for the sake of our own comfort and security. So let's just test Freud's theory here, shall we? 
These experienced sailors are up against a raging sea that is beyond their control, and they are perishing. And Jesus says, peace be still, and immediately the seas obey, and there is a great calm. And the disciples rightly conclude that they are in the boat with none other than God himself. How do they react? With great comfort? With a great sigh of relief? No, we read in Mark's Gospel, and they were filled with a great fear. The great calm caused in them a great fear. They were more afraid now than they were during the storm. The terror of the raging sea was nothing compared to the terror that they felt now. And they said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Lord of the universe, their maker, the maker of heaven and earth was in their boat and they realized it. And we might think that this would be just what these men were hoping for. Their troubles were over, their fears were gone, God was with them, everything would be okay, break out the champagne, let's have a party. But instead they were filled with great fear. So what's going on here? No need to psychoanalyze these men, Sigmund. We may simply listen to the diagnosis that Jesus pronounces. Have you still no faith? Do you still wonder if I care about you? Do you still wonder if I will let you perish? He shows them their no faith with a demonstration of his power to take care of them and to deliver them and to save them from perishing. That is, he works on their no faith so that they may have no doubt. He does just what they ask him to do and for some reason this terrifies the disciples. Why is this? It is, I think, because they never realized that he really would do it. Because they never really believed that he really could do it. Well, they believed that everything he said was good, and they believed that everything he taught was right. They may have enjoyed his sermons, they liked his clever little illustrations, but they never really believed that he ever intended to get into their boat and to actually be their God. And when he did, it terrified them because they realized that this Jesus is who he says that he is, that in him all of the deity of the Godhead dwells bodily. And he had done his deity incarnate right next to them. He had gotten into their boat and he had done his deity to them. Jesus had been given all authority in heaven and on earth, and he was using that authority to save them. And he was willing to let them sail right into the storm in order to prove it, that their no faith might become a great faith, even a living faith. And so whenever somebody says to somebody else, and I hear it, you should become a Christian because you're gonna be so much happier because it's so much safer. I always wonder what that means. It is, in fact, much safer and much less threatening to keep God at a safe distance from you. We can go through all of the motions. You can come to church, you can read your Bible, you can memorize your favorite verses, and yet never believe that he actually intends to do his deity to you. It's a nice idea, isn't it, that Jesus forgives sin. There's nothing threatening in that whatsoever. But it is at least a bit scary when Jesus speaks to you and says, I forgive you all of your sins. You mean he knows me that well? 
It's not very threatening to hear it said that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. But it shouldn't be too surprising if we were to fall down on our knees in fear and trembling when we hear him say to us, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Take and drink, this is my blood shed for you. Through holy baptism, God has gotten into your boat and he has gotten into your life, into your very body. And he intends to save you from perishing. As the waves of baptism washed over your head, you drowned in that sea. And no, God was not sleeping. He was active and at work through the water, drowning you into the death of Christ, raising you up from the dead, even as Christ was raised from the dead, all so that you might walk in newness of life. So don't get me wrong here, none of this, none of this means that no storms will come upon us if only you believe and believe enough. They most certainly will. And at times it will seem to us as if Christ our Lord is asleep and doesn't care if we perish. Were he to ward off every storm before it breaks over us, we would never know, we would never know just how trustworthy and true he is. In fact, being who we are, we would probably think that our calm and peaceful and happy little life is due to our excellent living. But to walk in newness of life is to live by faith, trusting with heart and mind that the Lord is, of all has gotten into my boat into my life, into my very body, and that all of the storms and all of the troubles of this world can bring to my life are all subject to his authority and obedient to his command, and that by these storms, by these storms, he turns our no faith into a great faith, even a living faith. It is in the storm that we learn that he is the king of the kingdom of God and the Lord over all who speaks to the raging sea and to our raging fears saying peace be still amen